This is the sermon for the fifth Sunday at Lent. This morning we are considering two passages. First, a passage from the tenth chapter of Mark's Gospel, and then from the Gospel according to Matthew, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, which will of course be our introduction to Holy Week. First, from Mark, the tenth chapter, beginning with the thirty-fifth verse. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. He said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand, and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant to James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. The great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now James and John have been watching Jesus. However, it's questionable how much they've understood, but they have surely been watching him. And it seems what they perceive is something new about to happen. A new order, we might say. A change in the system. A redistribution of power. And they, of course, want in. A piece of the action, so to speak. Or particularly, a piece of the action on top. When you come into your glory, we want to be your top generals. We want to be the vice presidents. We would like to have some glory, too. Jesus answered to them, Can you drink of the cup I will drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism I will be baptized with? And then, you don't know what you are asking. Not really. Jesus then goes on to explain that he does know what they think they are asking for. Of course, we've already said it. They think they are asking for a piece of the authoritative action. They want power. They would like to be in charge. And of course, Jesus tells them, that's not the way it works. We read that the other ten were angry with James and John over this. Although they were probably not angry over their lack of understanding. But more than likely, they were angry because James and John tried to cut the rest of them out. Hey, Jesus, come on. We're the brightest of your gang. We're the ones that deserve a share in the leadership roles. It seems they beat the other disciples to it. But then that's the way it works in real life, isn't it? You've got to be quick. Get the jump on the competition. Look out for number one. Sometimes even friends and co-workers can become competition. There are, after all, only so many positions, so many raises, so many good spaces available. In order for there to be winners, there will need to be losers. In verse 42, Jesus calls them together and says to the now arguing disciples, Let me teach you something. This new order you perceive coming. It's not going to be like what's done by, our text uses the word Gentiles, 
meaning outsiders, those outside of the group. In this case, frankly, everyone else. Jesus goes on, you know what they do. The rulers exercise authority over the subjects, lord it over them. But Jesus, recognizing that the twelve men in front of him, with all their faults, were the beginning of something new, something that to this day is still being born, still must come to full fruition, a new way to be. It shall not be so among you, says Jesus. Rather, the one great among you, the greatest one of all, shall be the slave. The order of things, orders in this world, the human world, orders that are set up by human beings, tend to be arranged top-down, with privilege, power, and might residing in the leaders. The greater the leader, the more power and privilege. That power is often ensured by the threat of violence, punishment, and even death. Look at the history of the world, history which is written by the great victors. Nations rise and fall over who has the superior forces. Might, it seems in human system, always makes right. The order that Jesus brings about. This order is the opposite of that, an order based on love, on service, on treating others at least as well as you wish to be treated yourself, on extending love, compassion, and forgiveness even to adversaries. Now let us move on to a traditional Palm Sunday reading. A reading from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21. And now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And I have spoken of this before. If you were reading this text in the NIV or the ESV or most any other modern English translation, you will see an editorial chapter heading with words to the effect of the triumphal entry. Now, with all due respects to the publishers of Bibles and the good work that they do, I wish that heading weren't there. And I can get away with wishing that, even among very conservative readers of the Bible, because the editorial headings are not original to the text. They are somewhat traditional, but not original. Now, I know the editors are trying to be helpful, and in some ways they are. But those headings can also be, I believe, misleading. Perhaps not intentionally, and perhaps they are, in fact, a product of our contemporary understanding. If you grew up in a church anything like mine, Palm Sunday was a big deal. 
it was celebrated with great pomp. Uh, pomp and palms, and sometimes flowers, and most often a big choir anthem and maybe a brass quartet. For it was a celebration of Jesus letting people see a little bit of his kingly self. At least it could seem like that until you really look at the text. There is, in fact, very little that is triumphal about riding a donkey. In Matthew's account, actually a pair of donkeys, a mother and a colt, go into town ahead of you. Take these donkeys, you will see. If anyone says anything, tell them the Lord needs them. Presumably, if Jesus set that up, he could have set up a white steed or a chariot. But instead, he asks for the donkey. Bring me a donkey and a colt. And those who gathered around in this first century version of a ticker tape parade, not the high and the mighty, but the kind of people with not much else to do during the day, the day laborers, maybe those with no jobs at all. So then we might ask ourselves, why did Jesus do this at all? I have a couple of possible answers for your consideration, both essentially getting at the same thing. Possibility number one. Jesus did this simply as a demonstration of humility. I, Jesus, if I am a king at all, am the pauper king, king of the people of little or no account, no great steed or chariot, instead a working man's beast of burden. My mother rode one such as this, as she carried me, my earthly father walking alongside, victims of the system of governmental oppression that in its lust for control ordered all its subjects back to their city of ancestral origins. So possibly an intentional show of humility, possibly misinterpreted right at the beginning by desperate people looking for a hero in any place they could find one. And then there's another a possible reason related to the first. Jesus is intentionally making fun, if you will, of the ways of the world, the way children might play at being a king or a knight. So Jesus mocks the idea of kingship as he rides into the royal city, feet nearly dragging on the ground, showing people the real and utter futility of human power. But either way, the message is clear, or at least it should have been and should be. I am not the kind of king you're thinking of. Just as I have said before and will say again, says Jesus, my kingdom is not of this world. And then we might ask, my kingdom is not of this world. What does that mean? Now often, I have heard it said that Jesus' kingdom not being of this world means that Jesus' kingdom is in heaven, or in some other dimension, or in some perfect realm that is yet to come. But a little bit of word study might give us something else to think about. The word used for world, or I should say that we translate as world, is cosmos. It's a word that can mean a number of related things, but here it means the created order, specifically the humanly created order. So then Jesus is saying, my kingdom is not of the human order. I don't do kingdom, as it were the way the world does kingdom. It's not a top-down kind of arrangement where the king rides in with power and majesty and might. In this new kingdom, the so-called ruler rides a poor man's beast of burden and goes on to die for the sake of all. 
it's not what you were expecting, we might hear Jesus say, but it can become something better. For in a world where the greatest one of all serves all, and in fact is willing to suffer for all, in a world where things are arranged not top down, but rather from the ground up, in a world where there will be no losers so that others can win, in a world where there need not be bombs and guns and militaries to scare people into short-lived and grudging peace. This, at least a little bit, is a picture of God's kingdom to come. Fantasy, pure fantasy, you might say. Who will really want to live like that? Human greed will always win out, will it not? And I would say, regrettably, you are right. Except for what was demonstrated on the cross, what we commemorate as we begin our journey towards Holy Week, where one man can forgive those who accused him falsely and murdered him, where one man can forgive the friends who disowned him and abandoned their cause, where we discover that even God is not what we expect, where God willingly becomes vulnerable, so vulnerable as to be killed by his own creation. In this particular world, this kind of cosmos, this new order, greater things, far greater things than we could have imagined, are possible. To all who seek to follow in the ways of Jesus, the ways of peace and nonviolence, the ways of non-retaliation, then we, the body of Christ, are the ones to build the new order, brick by brick, prayer by prayer, tear by tear, even as we endeavor to serve and to love, following the example of the one, though he was present at the beginning of the universe, still came to exemplify service, humility, and perfect love.